I want to just say thank you, Pastors Rob and Brenda, for having me today. And uh, it was a bit easier to come to this church today because I didn't have to control anything. Last time we did, uh, we went through all the songs, beautiful songs, but we left the uh, cover on the projector on and uh, it was crazy. But well, we had a good laugh. God bless you. Thank you for listening in and I hope you are encouraged. You know, if you want to uh, understand the image of God, which you should by now, but if you want to understand about the image of God, just look at Carla and uh, Shannon and look at the two children. You'll get to understand how God created us in his image. Not physically, but I think that's a good way to start. Your kids look just like you both, eh? If you want to know about hell, uh, listen to what I'm going to say to you. When GPS first came up, I was uh, uh, not sure how it works. And uh, so one day the GPS just took me in circles, round and round and round and round. Just couldn't work my way. I was so angry. I said, you go to hell. You probably shouldn't say that. And uh, 10 minutes later, it brought me to my mother-in-law's house. <laughs> no, nah, that's not true. <laughs> I just thought I'll, uh, I'll just, uh, just simmer you down. Um, um, God's Word always encourages, always convicts, always challenges, always brings hope, always brings uh, momentum. One thing it doesn't do, amongst others, it never condemns. It never condemns. I like the scripture Rob was reading. It's the grace of God through whom, you know, we are saved. And so this morning, I want you, when, you, when I finish, the objective is, if you went out of here and got nothing, you would still feel God's love for you. And uh, this morning, I want to, is that up there, Rob? I want to bring uh, a message. Actually, I, I prepared a different message today, but when I came here, I thought I'd share this message. Or I, I sort of thought about it last night. I'd share this message, which I shared last week at the Uniting Church. And uh, I want to talk about the three types of lovers we ought not to be. Turn around and say uh, to your person next door, he's going to talk about me today. Let's get straight into it. Three types of lovers we ought not to be. And I hope, as I said, it encourages you. And uh, when we leave, that uh, we will just uh, be so encouraged by his word. What a wonderful worship. I just want to give credit to Rhonda, uh, Brenda and uh, Carla. What a wonderful spirit of praise and worship. You know, we should be able to just... I know, I know, what you, I know many of you are thinking, when are we going to listen to the word? Just don't worry about what's coming next. Just enjoy the moment, eh? It was beautiful. I, I, I was really blessed by that. Thanks, guys. Um, so um, we will read the verse from Rob uh, sort of uh, talked about. And this is a last day message <laughs> because it says last day there. It's a last day message. He says, mark this. Take note. Be aware. Pay attention. These, there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, have nothing to do with such people. So the three types of lovers is found in this verse that we ought not to be is lovers of themselves. You can see that the lovers of themselves should have uh, underlined it. Lovers of money and lovers of pleasure. 
lovers of themselves or self, lovers of money, and lovers of pleasure. I want to bring it to you in those three, uh, 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 t- just a bit of Greek here, don't get too bogged down with it, but it's good to understand um, um, where these words come from. I want to talk about firstly the lovers of self. The translation lovers of themselves comes from this Greek word full autos. It, uh, first of all, philos, when the Bible talks about philos, it talks about affection, friendliness, and brotherly love. Filio love, brotherly love. It is an aspect of, the lo- of love that is directed to others. It's outward focus, it's love of others, or brotherly love. When you give me philos, or philios, uh, I'm warmed, I feel comfortable, I feel uh, relaxed in your presence. It's, it's eff- extending affection to someone else out there. And, um, but the second part is autos, um, which is completely opposite. It basically draws attention to self. So while you have philos, outward, you have autos, which is focused on self. Think about automatic or autobiography, where it's a, it's a story about self, about self. So, so when we understand automatic, or sorry, uh, when you take philos and combine it with autos, you get the love of self. Amazing, isn't it? Love of self. And this is Paul writing like 2,000 years ago, almost, if you, if you want to be precise, I'm not too sure, but I think it's around there. He says, in the last days, there will be people who love themselves. And uh, this is what selfish love is. It is self-consuming. It is self-focused. You are now living in a world, when you self-love, you're living in the world with one thing in mind. What's in it for You got it. What's in it for me? It is selfish. It's self-consuming and self-focused. It becomes sometimes narcissistic and a self-centered views, uh, a view, sorry. Now my question is, as I said, God's word always challenges, is this you? Is this you? Are you like that? Are you a lover of self? Um, just think of selfies. <laughs> probably, probably a bit too, uh, maybe a different audience to talk to about selfies. But don't be surprised, some mature people love selfies too. <laughs> Think about selfies. Uh, are you d- overdoing it in this aspect? Uh, you know, your photos all over social media. Um, okay, maybe you won't do selfies. What about when you go past the mirror? Pull it in a bit. You know, in the kingdom of God, Self is not the end of all. Self is not end of all. It's not the center of our existence. You know, one of the most uh, common scriptures, Jesus says, if any man will come after me, let him deny. Amen. God is the epicenter of all things. This is what Jesus said in the uh, greatest commandment. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind and love your neighbor and love yourself. And I'll talk about that loving yourself shortly. Because when we become Christians, it's not about us. Have you, um, have you um, seen the uh, Surfside buses that sometimes go and they say, sorry, out of service? Have you seen that, Michael? Seen that out of service? Uh, now I understand it. But first when I saw that sign, I laughed. I said, if it was out of service, that bus shouldn't be on the road. It's like, the biggest uh, uh, paradox, you know, 
by side of then I understood it's it's not taking passengers and that's how it is with us and God we can't be there saying I love you Lord but yet you have a self-centered narcissistic view about yourself and everything that you do centers around you what is in it for me I want to talk about keep that in, in mind I want to talk about the second um, uh, uh, lover we ought not to be so first of all we ought not to be lovers of self secondly we ought not to be lovers of money now the Greek word uh, comes the lover of money comes from full which means the love of money it means a greedy disposition or love of money or covetousness or avariciousness avarice or avarice which means greedy someone who is average or greedy or grasping us is someone that is influenced by a craving for wealth and a desire for personal gain now I know all of us would love to have lots of money nothing wrong with that nothing wrong with that but when you have a love of money um, many times the acid test is a negligence of generosity again the question needs to be asked or when you say am, am I a lover of money you have to ask yourself is money something that you make in the same question I asked about number one what is in it for me many of the many of the times I say I, I think if uh, you know as I, I just want to clarify it's a, it's the love of money that's the root of all evil in the, in one of the scriptures I'll read now 1 Timothy 6 10 it's not money it's the love of money having this uh, desire uh, a pressing desire for personal gain I want to get more I want to get more I want to get more and we know God is as we'll see shortly he's the source of everything and when he gives you more you ought more you know um, does this describe you are you generous are you hoarding this currently I'm not talking about saving <laughs> I'm talking about ordering. Are you ordering currently? Are you generous? You know, when uh, uh, we talk about generosity, and most times pastors have to talk about it, people say, oh, there he goes again. <laughs> Are you generous? You know, one of the images, one of us, uh, the, the, the byproduct of being created in the image of God is generosity. Generosity is a big ingredient. I, 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 I don't see Christians being ungenerous I'm not talking about giving away money there are many Christians who are generous in their time generous in their uh, compliments generous with their with their finances I think that's how it used to be you know um, what about you are you a dictator that is tight with your family that they cannot use their appliances at home <laughs> or you want the lights off by 8:30 at night all because you don't want your bills to uh, electricity or utility bills to soar you know recently um, uh, 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 it was a while ago when we were younger in marriage we, we went to uh, our friend's house and as we walked there uh, they were we were all just up and coming you know young families we didn't have much I didn't even have a house I was I was renting and my friend who I visited was renting in the in a hot building in South Africa where I was born hot buildings are common you you have a main building and you have another building that's probably a conversion of an old garage people would just uh, turn it into a flat or a granny flat and rent it out and it's, it's very popular there because of the housing shortage and um, I, one day I went to one of these uh, houses uh, that my friend lived in and uh, uh, him and his wife we, we had no children but then we just visited them and uh, I noticed a car a beautiful car in the garage I noticed a heap of appliances in the garage as well all you know all uh, left out there so I asked uh, my friend I said you're, you're a landlord you must be a very rich guy and very kind to his family he's, you know he's bought all this for them and uh, to my surprise he was the opposite 
He didn't allow anyone to use the car. He didn't even allow, my friends told me, for his family to use all the appliances. He wanted his wife to do the washing by hand. I thought, what a mean guy. And sometimes, you, you, you know, you might think, oh, that's an extreme. It pro probably is. But, you know, we must not be uh, so uh, stingy to the fact that we are ungenerous. We find that in... Uh, 1 Timothy 6.10, the Bible says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have heard from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. Now the love for money can be defined as this intense desire for more money and selfishly at that reason too. It's virtually, it's, the love of money is virtually the same as faith in money. Have you been putting faith in money? Have you been putting your trust, confidence and assurance in money? Money is the currency of human resources, no doubt. So the heart that loves money always trusts in human resources. But those who love money or lovers of, the, of money are those who are willing to do anything for the sake of money without regard to the morality of it. That's what the love of money is. They'll do anything for the love of money. The love of money is a big problem in all spheres, isn't that right? It's in the family, it's in the church, it's in the community, it's in the nation. And it's not unique to unbelievers. Even some believers struggle with the love of money. And we know Judas was a prime example. He betrayed Jesus because of the love of money. Jesus said that to us. And I hope you can see this clear because I think it's a... No man can serve two masters. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot trust in God in, and in money at the same time. One, uh, one will be belief and the other will be unbelief. A heart that loves money, that trusts in money for happiness, is not trusting God enough. Amen. We all have an issue with money. I don't think we all have plenty of it. Uh, if you do, God bless you for that share some of it but uh, <laughs> if you if you don't just trust God you know as I grow mature in the things of God uh, I, 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 earlier on in my life because of a career person I was I was very ambitious I, I chased after things I wouldn't say I, I had a un, uh, balanced approach to money but I wouldn't say I didn't as well so in between somewhere I was entrenched to that but you know, I started to chase after things. Now I do understand when you're 20 to 30 and 40, those are your springtime, right? Your springtime of your life. You achieve, you want to achieve, you want to achieve, you want to achieve. There's no problem with that. But the problem happens when you come to my age, 60, and you're still trying to chase things, chase things, achieve things, achieve things. You know, recently I had this wonderful revelation. I don't have to chase things. Things chase me. You know, seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. You know, when we trust money, it also means that we have an unbelief to God. But God does not deal in the currency of money. God deals, as Pastor Rob rightly said, in the currency of grace. Amen. It is grace. And he says here in Isaiah 55, 1, Come everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come and buy and eat. We are encouraged to take, make our life free from money and be content with what we have. For that's what God has promised. I will never leave you nor forsake you. I heard that in the prophetic word this morning. My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory. Amen. I don't know what you're going through. In fact, I don't know. Seriously. But I'm going to say to you, when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, all things that you need will be supplied, especially when you are not in a position to work for those things. Point number three is the lover of pleasure. Let's just go quick on this. The word lover of pleasure is a translation of the Greek word philodonos, which is a combination of the two words, philio and edonis. You've heard edonis before. The word edonis in the New Testament is a picture of people completely 
preoccupied with pleasure. We're not talking about you enjoying life in general, but it's they preoccupied with pleasure and the people who live for the gratification of their flesh thinking that it will bring them personal happiness. The English dictionary says that the, the hedonism is the doctrine of pleasure or happiness is the highest goal in their lives. It also means having an addiction to an obsession for, the, for pleasure as a way of life. Apostle Paul said that the, the society in last days will become lovers of pleasure. Isn't it true? They will become lovers of pleasures. In context, people will be excessive lovers of pleasures, much more than they are lovers of God. Their desire for own, their pleasure will be so great that it will far surpass their love for God. So much so that even if the pastor asks them to help with some um, duty in the church, they will, they will always consider their service to God uh, as how will it affect my decision to be free to do what I want. What about you? What about you, friend? Are you following pleasures more than you're following God? Are you watching Netflix or <laughs> surfing the web or hogging on to the remote? I'm not saying that's pleasure. I mean, there are times when you want to do that. You know, what about going shopping on a Sunday when you ought to be in church? Or going to the flea markets when you ought to be in church. You know, in these last days, people will be uh, obsessed by one question. If I get involved in church, how will it affect my own personal comfort, pleasure, or happiness? I want to encourage you today. There is no doubt a life of pleasure might bring some happiness. We do see that. But when I observe the life of all those who are going through pleasure, you know what is happening? The pleasure they have is okay for a little while, but it doesn't bring completely happy, complete happiness because pleasure of life cannot quench the thirsting or the hunger in your soul. The Bible teaches us in Psalm 16:11, At your right, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The pleasures that God gives you are pleasures that satisfies for everlasting to everlasting. So as I conclude this morning, my challenge is don't be lovers of self, don't be lovers of money, and don't be lovers of pleasure, but instead be these three kind of lovers that I want to show you through another verse, which is Mark 12. We'll read through that. One of the teachers of the law came and heard them debating. Noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he, he asked them, of all the commandments, which is the most important, the most important one, Jesus said, is this, Yea, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. So don't be lovers of self. Don't be lovers of money. Don't be lovers of pleasure. But instead, be lovers of God. And how do, should we love God? The Bible says, with all your heart, all your soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbors. Amen. This, this is what we ought to be. Lovers of neighbors. And you know from uh, the story of the Good Samaritan, it's just not, you know, the neighbors that are staying next to you, but it's all those that you would show mercy to. And love yourself. Now, you might say, I just said... Don't love yourself. No, but love yourself. You know, when we see God's grace, when we see ourselves through God's grace, when we love ourselves, when we appropriate His love uh, through uh, the highs of grace, we see ourselves in the correct position we need to see ourselves in. We are able to love others because we love ourselves. You know, one of the problems people are, uh, don't love other people today, I believe, it's not a judgment call, it's an observation. One of the reasons why people don't love others today is because they can't accept God's love for them. And they don't feel that uh, quantifiable or quality love that they should be feeling because they don't see that God wants to love them, or God has loved them 
He died on the cross for them. He set them free like the song Brenda wrote. What a beautiful song there. And how we are all free. We don't see that. But when you start seeing yourself through the eyes of grace, when you receive his pardon, when you know that you have a high priest that, is, that can empathize with your weaknesses. In fact, Hebrews chapter 4 I think, says we have an high priest who loves us, who cares for us, who wants the best for us, who understands our weakness. And you can come to him to gain mercy and obtain uh, grace you start loving yourself many Christians should start by loving themselves you know we know we have to love God we love uh, 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 you know others and love ourselves but I worked out that if you start loving yourself like you love God and see yourself through the eyes of God that he loved us that's why he sent Jesus upon the cross it's so easy to love God then so easy so easy and when we receive God's love, the art of loving yourself must be connected to loving others. Amen. It is in receiving God's love and seeing you, uh, seeing God loving you, then it's so easy to love people. I remember when I was 17, and I will close with this, I was 17, I had a terrible, um, you wouldn't say this now, but uh, I speak so, you know, before so many people now. Um, I could speak before a thousand people uh, and, and it won't bother me uh, and I have done that a couple of times not in preaching I must admit but in uh, uh, weddings and emceeing and all that um, and I had such a low self-esteem such a low self -esteem. my uh, mum used to tell me that uh, when I was a young boy younger than that I would not say a word and she got worried about me that something was wrong psychologically and sometimes I think that she was true in that <laughs> and uh, but as I grew when I received Jesus as my Savior at the age of 17 the Lord touched my life so much from a shy introverted scared couldn't speak lack, lack of self-esteem young man the Lord just put his hand upon me anointed me and just gave me the boldness and the confidence I began to see myself as one whom God loves as one whom he died for as one whom I have worth in his sight not by what I have done I am what I am by his grace not because of what I've done but because of what he has done for me and all that has changed me that you know sometimes I'm, I, I tend to be a little bit cocky or brash or because you go to the other extreme but I thank God I'm reminded daily I am what I am by his grace all that I have his hands have provided to God be the glory don't be a lover of self don't be a lover of money don't be a lover of pleasure but be a lover of God be a lover of your neighbors and be a lover of yourself Amen. Do you receive God's word this morning? Let's just pray. And when you see yourself as the temple of the Holy Spirit, it's so easy to find worth in your existence, in your purpose, in that image of God. You know, today I don't joke about anything about my life. I don't go and belittle me. I don't go talk me down. And it's not because I'm proud or I don't like that. I realize God lives in me by His Spirit. If I'm talking to someone here today, maybe someone kept telling you, you're no good. Are you nobody? You can do two things. You could either accept that and let it sink you down. Or you could say, no, I know I am somebody because God doesn't make junk. Amen. God loves you today, church. 
I want to encourage you all today. Some of you have labored this narrow way for many, many, many years. And sometimes you felt beaten down. Sometimes you felt unappreciated. Sometimes you felt I do so much and I get overlooked. But I want to tell you today, stay in the race. Stay in your lane. You are near to the finishing line. You're so close. Keep carrying the ball and don't drop it before you cross the line. As Pastor Brenda said earlier, we've not just got a room up there, we've got mansions up there. One of them is yours. I don't know what you're going through today and I, every time I come to the conclusion of any service, whether it's in the church or whether it's online, I say the same thing. I don't know what you're going through. But no matter what you are going through, God has sufficient grace to carry you through. No matter what your need is, God has a vast supply. No matter what your problem is, God has a solution for you, my friend. And no matter what your hurt or pain, God has a cure for you. You know, Jesus came to forgive all your sins. He came to take away, as we heard through the song today, all your fear, all your guilt, all your shame, all your condemnation. He came to give you eternal life. That is, you live forever. But one thing I know, you can't do this on your own. Only Jesus can do this for you. And today, as I said, I do this all the time, not targeting anybody. But if you have not received Jesus as your personal Lord, you haven't received him as the savior of your soul, maybe today, another opportunity Last week, we, my wife went to see a family member. He's 78, not feeling well. I think he was born into a Christian family. And uh, she asked him, are you saved? He gave her a wry smile without an answer. She said, dear so-and-so, you need to be assured of the salvation that Jesus gave you. And a few minutes later, he said the sinner's prayer with Vani. And she said, almost immediately thereafter, she felt his criticism is cynic or cynic being cynical just stopped I don't know about you friend if you have never received Jesus Christ as your Savior is there someone that will say look I've been attending church but I don't know if I made that decision to make him Lord of my life if you hear this morning before I hand over to Pastor Rob why don't you raise your hand most times people don't because most of them, most of the people that listen to the word in churches, most of them are saved. It's, it's just having an assurance of your salvation more so. If you're here this morning, raise your hand. If not, I'm going to pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word today. There are three lovers we ought not to be. Lovers of self. Lovers of money lovers of pleasure and they are lovers that we ought to be lovers of god lovers of our neighbor and lovers of ourselves we thank you the word reminds us that god is loved today and i pray that each one of us even as we leave here a little later in the morning just a short while from now that we will all experience the love of god and we will be assured of 
the love that God has for us. Thank you for this morning. May your word bring encouragement. May it bring hope. May it bring warning for us to stay away from things that will dampen our journey. In Jesus' name, amen.